A divided Republican Party struggles to define itself as members of the U.S. Congress return to work. Is the Tea Party to blame? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Kimberly Halkett. After the 2012 U.S. elections, it seemed the far right wing of the Republican Party was weakening. Several supporters of the Tea Party lost their seats in the House of Representatives. Mitt Romney's election defeat unleashed a debate among Republicans over who was to blame. Well, moderates insisted it was time for the party to work on expanding the base. Tea Party members called for an even more conservative agenda. Well, those fault lines have once again been highlighted as members of Congress returned to Capitol Hill this week. First, there was the fiscal cliff, which saw a division between Republican leaders in the House of Representatives almost derailing the deal. Wary of asking conservatives for more spending, House Speaker John Boehner refused to bring to a vote critical storm relief funds for the victims of Hurricane Sandy. It was only after Republicans from New York and New Jersey threatened to vote against his reappointment as Speaker that Boehner finally backtracked. Well, on Friday, a smaller version of the legislation was passed. Then there was the Violence Against Women Act, which historically has had strong bipartisan support. Despite passing in the Senate with a strong majority, House Republicans did not even bring the bill to a vote after the law was changed to include Native American and illegal immigrant victims of domestic abuse. Well, joining us now from Madison, Wisconsin, is political writer for The Nation magazine, John Nichols. From New York, we have Steve Lonigan, the New Jersey State Director for Americans for Prosperity. And here in our studio, we are joined by John Fury. He's a Republican strategist and former spokesman for the former Speaker of the House, Dennis Haster. John, I want to start with you. you know, given some of the recent fault lines that have been exposed, how different is the Republican Party now than it was, say, a generation ago? I think it's much more conservative. I think uh, after the, the 2010 election, it became much more conservative. I think Barack Obama, his, his uh, ascendance to the White House made the party much more conservative. I think it's much more focused on fiscal issues. Uh, after the war in Iraq, I think it's a little bit more isolationist than it was before. Um, and uh, the party has moved uh, a little bit more to the right than it was in, in the 2000s. George Bush was a compassionate conservative. I don't think right now a compassionate conservative could get to be uh, the nominee for the, for the Republicans. Steve Lonigan, do you now, agree Cam, with that? I got, I yeah, I, I think that a generation ago to me would be, say, Ronald Reagan. I don't think the party's become more conservative. I think the problem we have is it's become too moderate, that moderates have had too much, you know, say in what's happening in Washington, not on the grassroots level, and they let down the grassroots. They've let down the Tea Party leadership and the Tea Party activists that gave them control of the House in 2010. Can the party continue on that trajectory, Steve, though, given the fact that it has moved further right? Uh, the, if, if you mean a trajectory towards conservatism, I think that's what it absolutely has to do to survive and to lead. And I, I think that this Boehner deal, which is extremely disappointing, could be the best thing that's ever happened to the conservative movement in a very long time. I think as a result of this, you're going to see a lot of primaries in 2014 against all those uh, Tea Party elected Republicans who got up at every one of their speeches and said, we're going to defund Obamacare and then turned around and funded Obamacare. They're going to pay a price. And you're starting to hear a lot right now around the country about people talking about running primaries against incumbent Republicans. And John, I want to bring you in. The, you know, primaries or nominating contests, as many of our international viewers are more familiar with it. Uh, it, it really seems to be where this Tea Party base has its strength. But we saw in the 2012 elections that overall it, it's somewhat weakened. What, what does that say to you? Does that say that that sort of movement has become more of a mindset for the party? Or is the Tea Party still very much alive and strong within the Republican base? I think the best way to understand it is this. Uh, the Republican Party is much, much more conservative than it was 30 years ago. Remember when Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, you had Republicans in the U.S. Senate who voted very nearly 100% uh, AFL-CIO pro-labor line, who were big environmentalists, who were big supporters of abortion rights. Some of the first supporters of gay rights in, in the Congress were Republicans. And so the Republican Party has moved on both social and economic issues far to the right of where it was, say, 30 years ago. But now we have a question of, will it move dramatically further to the right? 
And that is a great internal debate within the Republican Party. There are the Tea Party folks uh, who are really a dynamic force within the party saying, look, we have to become a very clearly defined fiscally conservative party. That has to be our clear signal. There are other folks, though, more moderate players, uh, still quite conservative, but, but not in the Tea Party camp, who say, look, we have allowed the Tea Party to be a major force in this party. The problem is they have done things like what happened in Indiana, where the Tea Party displaced Senator Richard Lugar, who was a 100% conservative on a lot of issues, and created a circumstance where a Democrat got elected to that seat in 2012. There's a number of examples like that. And when I talk to Republican leaders, one of the things they say is, we like that the Tea Party has given us clarity. We do not like that the Tea Party forces us uh, into these primary situations where we lose people who are essential to our majority. So or expects this us to fight's going to gonna play promises. out. And what what you're saying is, is, if I may, what you're saying yeah. is we don't yeah. like it when these Tea Party conservatives expect us to live up to our promises. You know, this thing that we, the Republicans have become more conservative is not true. The country is in a fiscal mess. It's a fiscal disaster. Forget the fiscal cliff. That's nothing compared to our $16 trillion debt, uh, our QE3, our constant inflation of our currency, printing of money, our exploding national debt, and losing our economic leadership in the world. That's something that's happening today that didn't happen 30 years ago. You can talk about these social issues all you want, but that's secondary to what's happening with the funding of entitlement programs on our exploding national spending. And that's where conservatives are going to have to take the lead. To well, this let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say something. Let me jump in here. What Ronald Reagan used to say is, I want to nominate the most conservative person who could win. What the Tea Party has said and continues to say is, I'm going to nominate the craziest conservative I can get, and I don't care if they win or not. And that's what happened to us in Indiana, where we lost because of Richard Bordock, Todd Akin, we lost in Missouri, and the election before, we lost Sharon Engel to Harry Reid. The Tea Party killed us with Harry Reid, which Harry Reid should not be the majority leader of the Senate right now, except for the Tea Party. So the Tea Party, yeah, it animated a lot of people, but it made a lot of bad mistakes in the, 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 the primary well, process. Well, it's also made it difficult yeah, in yeah, terms you know of what? legislating. You know I want to jump in here for a second, gentlemen. I want to talk a little bit about that ideological rigidity that we're seeing because it certainly made it difficult when it comes to legislating. We saw that not just with the debate over the right. fiscal cliff that not only spilled into the 11th hour but went right over the deadline, but we also saw it when it came to funding for the victims of Hurricane Sandy. I think you see that when you when you hear uh, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, he pulled no punches in his reaction to news that disaster relief was held up just because of this hardline partisan positioning. Take a listen. This used to be something that was not political. You know, disaster relief was something that you didn't play games with. But now in this current atmosphere, everything is the subject of one-offsmanship. Everything is a, is, is a possibility, a potential piece of bait for the political game. And it's just, it is why the American people hate Congress. It's why they hate them. America deserves better. It's just another example of a government that has forgotten who they are there to serve and why. 66 days and counting. Shame on you. Shame on Congress. So there you have Chris Christie, a very prominent member of the Republican Party, John, who is, is, is saying, in fact, that, you know, this... Many people say that this is just an example of what's happening when you it highlights the divisions, his viewpoint, you know, being a very strong party member, but then going out and using such strong language against members of his own party over that rigid position. Well, the problem for John Boehner was he was trying to pass... Uh, this thing came, th th this is a real breakdown in the political process first, the appropriations process. It was a big bill. It had a lot of, a lot of junk in it, and it, it probably should not have passed that quickly. Uh, it was jammed by the Senate. They really needed to take a, a, a longer look at that piece of legis legislation. Now, I understand where Chris Christie's coming from. He wants that money because he's governor, and he's got responsibilities to his constituents. But uh, there is a point here where we spend too much money, and we've got to spend a lot less, and there needs to be a much more careful process. Steve Lonigan, you want to respond to that? Well, that Hurricane Sandy bill, which we at AFP has opposed now since the beginning, is nothing but a ridiculous pork barrel spending bill. And this is the one thing John Boehner did that was right, is that he stopped it from being pushed through Congress and all this money being wasted. Remember, four years ago for Hurricane Andrew, Florida got $7 billion. 
for all that damage. New Jersey is going to get 30 billion, and Northeast 60 billion. That's just an outrage. It's just not even justifiable. But I want to go back to what John was saying earlier about Ronald Reagan saying electing the most conservative person. I worked on the Reagan campaign as a volunteer back in 1980 when the moderate Republicans were saying that Reagan was a conservative ideologue, that he couldn't win, that he was too conservative. But we elected him anyway. And now those same moderates pour to Ray Reagan constantly. And now the same moderate establishment those, those Republicans John told Nichols us that Mitt Romney was the real conservative. Yeah, let the me, same moderate Republicans let me try and told us out. that Mitt um, Romney was the, the real conservative. John Nichols, go ahead. Let me try and sort this out. Uh, the fact of the matter, I covered Ronald Reagan, interviewed a lot of, you know, was around the White House in those days. And, and the fact of the matter is that Ronald Reagan was a genuine conservative. He believed in a, a set of ideals and, and ideas, but he was also a man of government, a very rational governing figure. And so again and again throughout his tenure, he looked at the circumstances that were presented to him and he responded to them based not merely on his ideology, but also on the practical realities of the moment. This is the great challenge for the Tea Party at this point. The Tea Party is the dynamic force within the Republican Party. There is no doubt of that. However, you cannot have a successful Republican Party that excludes the entire Northeast of the United States, that writes off the entire West Coast of the United States, and that frankly writes off most urban areas and, and a lot of the, the Northern tier. And that's the challenge that has come into play. The Tea Party ideology plays very, very well in the Deep South and the interior West. It starts to fall apart as you get to places like New Jersey, New York, New England. It starts to fall apart as you go along the West Coast. And I think that's the exactly for the something Party that, that point New York's Republican is to House re speak representative to the whole of the country. Okay, and let's let's take a look at what Peter King had to say about that because Peter King blasted his own party, sort of alluding to the very point you're making there, John, on Fox News this week. Here's what he had to say: They wonder why they are becoming a minority party why we are going to be the party of the permanent minority. They're supposed to be the party of family values when there are families that are starving, families that are suffering, families that are spread all over living in substandard housing. This was a disgrace. It was inexcusable. And I've had it. As far as I'm concerned, I'm on my own. That is the words of Peter King there. Very strong position. I mean, John, what, what does that say? I think it highlights uh, to many in the United States well, that yeah. these divisions have made legislation impossible. Well, let me, first of all, let me talk about Peter King. He's a great guy. I've known him for a long time. And he's speaking out for his, his constituents who were hit very hard by this hurricane. Uh, and I think that a very emotional response. He met with the speaker and the next day. He really tempered th those remarks. Let me also say something about Ronald Reagan. I worked on the 84 Re Reagan campaign. Ronald Reagan also had the 11th Amendment. The 11th Amendment was Republicans shall not attack other Republicans. And the only thing the Tea Party does is attack other Republicans. If they spent half their time and half their, half their energy attacking Barack Obama, this country would be much better off. But no, they spend most of their time uh, nominating people who cannot win in a general elections. Ronald Reagan, yes. all, Ronald Reagan was a great leader. And he was someone who took, put George Bush, who was an establishment Republican, as his vice president because he understood that we had to have unity and not what we have with this ter current Tea Party, which is complete destruction of the party. First of all, Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment is a total myth. Ronald Reagan started winning the 76 election when he started attacking Gerald Ford head to head. So that's total nonsense. And he that's did not nonsense. That was all part of the, that's, 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 that's he always that's what he said. Absolutely not. He absolutely no, that's not. Ridiculous. Ronald Reagan attacked George Bush starting in North Carolina. That's, that, that's when he came close to winning that election. He attacked the daylights out of Bush. I mean, I'm sorry, against Ford. Mm -hmm. And that's when he started winning. And Gerald he did Ford. make an establishment Republican vice president. And that guy went down in one term when he went back to the liberal Republican agenda of raising taxes. And we saw John Boehner do that again just the other night. John Nichols, what do you think the prescription is, though, if, if the, the party is in turmoil and needs some sort of a, a prescription for renewal? What is it? Mm -hmm. Look, it needs dynamic leadership. Uh, one of the realities of the American political process is that unlike in a lot of countries around the world, we actually have very weak political parties. We don't have um, the sort of youth movements that develop leadership and then kind of feed people up through the process that you see in, say, a Germany uh, or in a Scandinavian country. What we have in the United States are political parties that are, tend to be defined by the people who step up and take leadership roles. At this point, the Republican Party leadership has been obliterated. 
Um, you've lost uh, very much of the top, top level folks. Romney's out. Paul Ryan was very much weakened by his vice presidential run. Uh, you have John Boehner, who looks very, very weakened at this point, and McConnell's never been a particularly appealing public figure. And so what the Republican Party needs now is for somebody to step up, or maybe a group of people to step up, and really speak in an articulate way. You know, one of the reasons that, that both of our other guests here, who are, who are superbly articulate, very, very intelligent, very engaged people, they both say, oh, Ronald Reagan's True. this great guy, we love him, and then they use their image of Ronald Reagan against the other guy. Well, the reality is, there's a reason why that happens. It's because Reagan was able to unite relatively moderate Republicans with very conservative Republicans. This well, Republican I'll Party tell you what, there's needs another big a problem. new dose of leadership. If it does not have it, this party will not and I, prevail in 2014. Know, I, Kim, and I, I will tell you that, if they lose in 2014, they're in crisis. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in lose, here. But, Kim, I just want to insert something. He, he's not all wrong. Even though, Look, looking back, the fact that we have to reach back 30 years to Ronald Reagan for a vision of leadership is a little disturbing at this point. I'm a big Ronald Reagan fan. I want to look to the future. I want to see new leadership now. Now, look at a guy like Paul Ryan. He goes out the other night and he votes for Boehner's deal. Paul Ryan, the fiscal conservative, voted for mm -hmm. Boehner's deal or for the Obama deal. Then he comes out today, and he's one of the 67 that voted against the $9.7 trillion uh, billion dollar extension of, uh, of flood insurance, the essential part of the Hurricane Sandy Bell. Kind of hard to explain. So is it just an issue of leadership, though, or is it also... Uh something when it comes to the issues that the party is sort of addressing and, and take a listen to what Republican presidential candidate John Huntsman talked about when he talked about the state of his party recently with Britain's Daily Telegraph. Here's what he had to say. He said, the party right now is a holding company that is devoid of a soul and it will be filled up with ideas over time and leaders will take their proper place. We can't be known as a party that's fear-based and doesn't believe in math. In the end, it will come down to a party that believes in opportunity for all our people, economic competitiveness, and a strong dose of libertarianism. And John Fury, is, is, is this one of the, the, the issues that the party needs to address? It's not just a matter of leadership, but it's also about choosing the right issues and clinging to those issues. Well, I, I agree with that. I think in, in, in many ways we have to be an, a, an opportunity party. I believe firmly in having a much smaller uh, government. I think we need to have government not get involved in everybody's lives. I think that the, 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 the government's way too intrusive. And I do think we need to recast it. I think that we have this, this sense that in many ways we want to get in everyone's bedroom, but we also, uh, you know, want to have, uh, we're, we're just not, we have to be more consistent on our messaging. And I do think that we do need uh, the new leadership. And I, I actually, I like a guy like Rand Paul. I, I think he offers a lot of compelling ideas. So I'm not necessarily against the, uh, the, the, the most of the precepts of, of the Tea Party. I'm, what I'm against is putting up bad candidates and losing elections. John Nichols, is the prescription to be more social moderate as well? No, I don't think that works in the Republican Party at this point. I, I've been to every Republican convention since 1988. And I've been on the floor of the convention. When you actually talk to the delegates, the, the people who are the, the core of the party, you will find that the single issue that draws them together overwhelmingly is their opposition to abortion rights and opposition to reproductive rights. And so to try and move to a social moderation, I think, is, is not realistic. But uh, I think there is, there's a middle ground there. If you look at a figure like a Jack Kemp or even Paul Ryan at his best, even George W. Bush at his best, they were able to be socially conservative but to place an emphasis, uh, and I'm talking in the campaigns, not necessarily how they governed, place an emphasis on the fiscal issues. I think that the Republican Party has an opportunity to come in as an opportunity party that really does emphasize a positive vision of fiscal responsibility and, and to be in, in play. But if it is merely a negative party, if it is a party that d divides itself between two activities, one, hating Barack Obama, and two, hating any Republican who doesn't hate Barack Obama as much as somebody else does, then you end up with a party that ultimately is too internally focused. It's not taking a message out to the American people. It's really kind of arguing in its own narrow zone. That's what happened in 2012. That is why Barack Obama won five million more votes than Mitt Romney. It's why the Democrats increased their number of seats in the Senate. And it is why in the House of Representatives, more than a million more people voted for Democratic candidates for the House 
than for Republican candidates. That was a white you know, and that had a lot to do with the fact that the Republican Party was identified as too negative. Well, look, in 2010, Republicans swept the House of Representatives on a very conservative message, and Americans bought it big time and gave control of the House to the Republican, conservative, Tea Party, people, whatever you want to call them. The nation but, but Steve, did they buy it again in 2012? No, they didn't. But the nation doesn't change its brain cells or its DNA in two years. What happened is the Republican Party leadership messaging weakened. It softened up. They were unclear. Romney did not have a clear, articulate message. We need bold leadership that are going to get out and talk openly okay. about what we're going to do about dismantling Social Security and realigning it, what we're going to do with the Medicare threat, what we're going to do with the fact that our national debt is exploding year after year after year, and that the Federal Reserve Bank has its printing presses running 24 hours a day. That's ultimately the biggest issue facing this state. I don't see any Republicans right now addressing that. John Ferry, do you see any Republicans within the party who maybe could rise up and, and provide this leadership and fill this void that seems to exist in the party right now? Oh, I think there's plenty of leaders that could do that. There's a lot of smart folks who decide not to run this time around. I mean, I like someone like a Jeb Bush. I like so, who's, who the government has a true conservative down in Florida. I Why think, does I he think, work? I think, well, because I think he I think he appeals to Hispanic voters. I think he has a, a brand of conservatism that could be sold to all facets of the party and to a lot of Democrats. I really like a Marco Rubio. I think Rubio best articulates kind of why America is a special place to live. Uh, I, Relative I, young candidate from right, Florida, I, a very I, diverse part of the right, United I States. Like, I like someone like a John Kasich who's taken an economically conservative message and really applied it to the state of Ohio and really is the reason why Ohio has come back economically economically. He, he blends both economic conservative and, and social conservatism. I mean, th there are plenty of people who decided to sit this one out because they, they, did, they either weren't ready or they didn't think they could beat Obama. I would make a point, though. Midterm elections are different than general elections. And if we want to be a national party, we have to do in, well in on your elections, not just midterm elections. Uh, Steve Lonigan, who, who do you think needs to kind of fill this void and can provide the prescription that's necessary to allow the party to evolve and make it strong and viable in the next election? election. I agree with John. There's a number of good people, Rand Paul being amongst them, I and even Sarah Palin, by the way, who I think is extremely dynamic. So we have a lot of, we have a great bench in the Republican Party if we have the courage to articulate very clear, bold messages and not worrying about, you know, dancing around and try to satisfy the middle. To win an election, you need to get 51 percent of the vote, not the majority of the vote. Not, I mean, not more than that. We're not going to get everybody to vote for us. America is a right of center country. We are by nature a conservative country. And we, we appeal to our people with a clear conservative message, one that makes sense, uh, one that has a compelling future, then we win. So, John Nichols, last word to you then. If that's the case, the point that Steve has made there, why hasn't the Republican Party won the majority vote in such a long time, except uh, the exception being when, when it was an incumbent who was in, who was in office? Mm -hmm. Well, I, even, even in George Bush's uh, re-elect in 2004, um, he won with a smaller percentage and a, and a smaller margin than Barack Obama did in 2012. I think the important thing to understand is, is something that John said just a moment ago. Uh, in an off-year election, when you have a depressed turnout, a much smaller turnout, it is possible for more extreme ideology to, to do well. In an on-year election, in a presidential election, that just does not work. Now, the future of the Republican Party is there. I mean, it's not going to disappear, but it is going to have to go through a transition period. Now, we heard names mentioned, and all of them credible. I would also throw another name into the mix, and it might be, in a sense, surprising. I think it is possible that Paul Ryan might reemerge, not as a hero of the Tea Party, but as a, a, a hero, in a way, of the Jack Kemp-style moderates, or at least somewhat more moderate figures. But Ryan many see is him as very polarizing figure. at the he same time. He was never aligned with the Tea Party. Well, but that's the thing. He, he, if you look at Ryan in the 2012 race, he tried to fit into the Romney campaign. The fact of the matter is, Paul Ryan is not a Tea Party conservative. He never has been. He's a man of government. But by the same token, he's very fiscally oriented, very fiscally conservative. Uh, I'm going to be watching him closely to see how he develops in the next few months, maybe the next year, uh, because he's got a name and he has a, a very precise way of thinking about stuff, uh, which has not been presented. It certainly wasn't presented in the in the disastrous Romney campaign. So I think there are there and are a lot of figures. Tar, this by the way, he voted for Tarr. Gentlemen, Tar I'm afraid we are out of time. It's certainly yeah, true did. the he's Republican a, Party will moderate. have to do a lot of soul yeah. searching. But for now, that is all from the team here in Washington D.C.
Thanks for watching Inside Story Americas. I want to remind you, don't forget to follow us on Twitter as well as on Facebook. That is where you can find more information about the program. We want to hear from you. Tell us what we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us here at Inside Story at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching.